uh, when I was watching the debates, um, when we got to a point where Trump was talking about um, racial insensitivity training and he was like denouncing it, it you know, it, it got me going, you know, and then this is the clip that triggered it. And so I put this clip up and the clip rep uh, prompted a response from a lot of people. This is my new Twitch, the uh, TikTok to specifically promote Twitch clips. And the, 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 a lot of people were saying, well, no, you know, um, it's talking about um, critical race theory and how toxic it is. So it made me want to, like, look into critical race theory and talk about it. So let's first look through the, the, the video that prompted such a heavy response from people. And then we're going to go uh, and we're going to look into uh, everything else. OK, so let's get into this. For instance. You had no so, certain let's, person. If you're a certain person, if you're a black person, for instance, you had no status. You have no status, right? In life, it was sort of a reversal. And you got it reversed. That's the fucking point. That's the whole point. That's the point of racial insensitivity training is so that people who have a particular status of poverty or whatever fucking negative status is associated with being black in life. Is to be reversed. That's what it's doing. That's what it's supposed to do. This is single-handedly the stupidest fucking thing Trump said the entire night. And nobody's giving shit. Nobody's giving him shit for it. Certain person. So, right. Here's the thing. Now, people corrected me and said, oh, it uh, has to do with uh, critical race theory and the application of it, you know. And what we have to understand something is that the complete display of what Trump said was, I don't like uh, insensitivity training. Or sensitivity training, racial sensitivity training, and like he didn't, and like he didn't give any good reason why. He just kind of like threw off a couple of talking points and moved on. Um, and it's really does not properly um, exemplify what he believes. Now we'll go through the, the his talking points in a little bit, but first I wanted to actually go through uh, what critical race theory is supposed to be because my stance on critical race theory as of right now is the theory seems solid, but the application seems incorrect. That's what the problem is. It's, I don't think it's being applied correctly. And I would say that we, it, it's put on the scale of, you know, non-political correctness to political correctness to overly political correctness. And while the theory is sound, the application is too politically correct to a point where I feel like it is, to an extent, demonizing uh, like straight white cisgender men, right? Or rather, really just white people. In general, since this isn't something that's, you know, uh, it's, this is a race theory, right? So let's get into this. Let me watch it's a short video on, like, basically summing up what race theory is, and I'm going to give my perspective on it. Okay, so critical race theory is... Not the bad thing, it needs to be a little louder. ...is what we're moving into now. Maybe we could be a little bit louder than that. A little louder than it. Um, and so... There are um, so critical race theory is uh, comes out of the legal studies, um, and it started roughly in the early mid nineties. I just just to start off, I was just like, I find it a little silly that it's like a white guy explaining this critical race theory to like a couple of black people. I think she's black. Maybe I'm wrong. I just found it like a little like <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? You know, it's a little ironic. So. Um. And it has now permeated most fields uh, in academia. And so it's an excellent way to begin studying race. Um, what they do has, and the research that has come out of critical race theorists has really uh, shifted the way we understand race to reflect more accurately how, it, how race and racism function. And so there, there are, it's not really a methodology in the way that other fields have methodologies. It's more of a thematic approach. Um, and so we actually like a thematic approach. And so there are several themes that we want to highlight for our work here and practicing anti-racism that we think are important from critical race theory. It's like the worst so, uh, presentation ever. They just keep showing the first point, then they... <laughs> so the first is that racism is normal. I zoomed in. That racism is part of how our society operates. Like it's just the normal way our society operates. And now, to that point, I would like to say, and I lo that's an uncomfortable thought, but like, yeah, racism is rather normal um, in our society. Um, you know, guys, for, for, you know, and this may seem rather anecdotal, but, you know, I'm a blue, I was a blue collar worker for quite a while. Um, it's very normal 
to be racist in society, even like, or rather in these blue collar spaces, you know, in general, like it's not even from just white people. It's almost everybody, like even against black people, honestly. Uh, that's very much what, you know, people making backhanded jokes, you know, they think it's lighthearted, but it's rather diminishing. Um, I've seen individuals, you know, say racial slurs, you know, under their breath, but loud enough for, for others to hear. It's more normal than we think. And I think a lot of times as young people, a lot of people are like, well, I don't see it a lot. And it's because you guys are doing better, right? But it still does exist in society. And we need to understand that young people don't rule society quite yet. Okay. Um, but it is very normalized in society. Uh, I think that the problem can kind of lie in the expression of how that's normal. Because like I said, non-political correctness is simply not giving a shit. Political correctness is like what I just said. Like, hey, racism is rather normal in our society. There's a lot of racial undertones we may not understand. Um, there may be some like, what do they call it? You know, I don't know subconscious biases. Uh, that we kind of exhibit when we look at individuals, um, you know, <clears throat> it exists and it's it happens. What happens though is when people take it to the next level and they weaponize that message and they start being hateful towards white people who really are not the oppressors, right? Like again, a lot of young, I would say, people aren't racist and they kind of get like demonized for, or young white people, and they get demonized. For, for the racism in society when they aren't really direct contributors. And what ends up happening is you push way too hard and those people end up becoming more racist because they're shamed for simply existing. Okay? And that's that's the thing. Um, something being common does, does mean it's, it's normal. Yeah, it does. I think you might have meant it doesn't, but anyway, let's move on. And so this... And, and for context... Uh, you know, to the second point, the way American society was intentionally structured. Yeah, there we have to acknowledge that there was an intentional structuring of society um, based on, like, racism, right? It's the truth. It kind of happened. It's, again, I don't think that that is nearly, it's not nearly as supported today as it used to be. But when society was being constructed, you know, slavery was very much a thing. And even other uh, white groups were, were being uh, treated like shit, you know, like the Irish, for example. As society grew up, it happens to be, though, that like black people take the brunt of it. And like a lot of times, a lot of white groups actually ended up coming together uh, over the um, their, their tribalistic, you know, disliking of black people. So it's something to consider. Because you see it still today, even with white and Hispanic people, like I see it more often than you really should is like bonding over hating uh, black people. It's bizarre. It's tribalistic. It's bizarre. Um, and ra frankly, it's rather disgusting. One of the things that this means is that racism is the common everyday experience of most BIPOC folks. Um, and so for us as white people, we usually think of racism as something that rears its ugly head every now and then. And, and this is a fantastic point, guys. I need you to understand. So a lot of people, they, they look at racism as like very, very outward, aggressive forms of racism. Like I guarantee every one of you in the chat, if you if you saw a black a white guy beating the shit out of a black guy and like screaming like racial obscenities, you'd be like, that guy's a racist. He's a bad person, right? Um, <clears throat> but it's more difficult when the situation gets more nuanced, right? That's like the problem, right? For instance, like a white guy following a black guy around the store. It's more nuanced because a lot of people be like, well. He's following them around because, you know, black people steal more. And now we get into like these, what are they called? Implicit biases, as I think was what it called. You understand my point, right? And you could say like, oh, maybe they are. But again, my constant argument is that systemic racism has, it has crafted a culture for, you know, for black Americans, just like it's crafted a culture for white Americans as well, right? Because systemic racism, environmental, um, you know, envi the env our environment has crafted us, right? And we're crafted in a way to uh, focus very heavily on stereotypes uh, due to these environmental procedures in the same way that black people in impoverished areas have been crafted uh, to, you know, have a, a culture that centralizes around government distrust and crime and whatnot, right? <clears throat> um, but most of the time, otherwise, it's not, uh, it's not a problem. And so that's wrong. Right. That's what critical race theorists have pointed out, that racism is actually normal. 
um, not aberrational is what they say. And sure, and again, I would like to, to just kind of like point out again that the racism is more nuanced, right? Um, than it is like outward specific racism. And it's something that we should acknowledge so that we can slowly as a society counter it, especially you younger people who are going to be running the society. It's good for you guys to be like, oh, I understand these complex theories because older people, <clears throat> they just, they're going to get to a point they're just not going to get it. They're going to get super uncomfortable with the idea that like, you know, there is an issue with race. They're going to get super uncomfortable with the idea that like that being white in society does mean that you do have a leg up or rather that people of color have a leg down if you'd like to look at that. And that makes them too uncomfortable because they feel like they're being assaulted for it. And again, there is an argument to be made that there are people who are trying to assault white people for it, like mentally assault. Right. And we need to make sure we keep it in context. <clears throat> and when somebody's like, oh, white privilege, you're bad. This, that. Another thing you say, listen, I understand that being white means that uh, you've had less of an advantage than me. But like, I'm not your enemy. Right. I'm somebody who's been trying to fight against systemic racism. I acknowledge it. I understand it. Right. And then you contextualize the solution where it would be like, you know, uh, outreach of opportunity as well as a community issue within those particular communities as well. The second is um, interest convergence. They fucked it up. See, the third is interest convergence. Oops. Okay, we ordered those differently. <laughs> okay, so interest. And this this point is something you guys, I think a lot of you guys, especially conservative people, will really like understand. Because just so you know, this isn't like a conservative issue. This is like an American issue. And this right here, in my opinion, exemplifies like the, the Democratic Party uh, today. Convergence. Uh, and this is the idea that uh, anti-racist movements tend to make progress when it is in the best interests of those in positions of power, not yeah. necessarily due to moral persuasion. Yeah. So, like, honestly, let's be honest here. Let's look at the George Floyd situation. Horrible example of police brutality. But the, 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 the progressive media pushed it as a race issue and riled tensions when I really don't think it was a race issue. He wasn't killed because he was black he was killed because of a police officer who is a failure at his job right and you saw a lot of like you know um a lot of progressive media push it as a race issue because it garnered them like you know honestly like views and uh, you know ad revenue and, and favor from black people you know and I, I said it during the thing and i'll say it again all tokenization of black people and their issues rather than actually trying to come to like a solid conclusion of how do we we, how do we deal with this and you see that in the, the the democratic party where they promote in my opinion feel good solutions rather than promoting we, real wealth redistribution and an extension of opportunity to black areas it's like how much do we have to give you as a black community for you to not only to just shut the fuck up and to think that we're your ally and while i don't know if it's necessarily a conspiracy in the democratic party <clears throat> i do think that's what's happening right so the example that's used um uh like the classic example is the civil rights act and the civil rights movement and so what critical race theorists have pointed out with the civil rights act is that it wasn't only the uh, civil rights activists and their efforts that gained uh, the signing of the Civil Rights Act. Um, another critical uh, aspect of this were white political elites and the interests of the United States on the world stage. Mm -hmm. So at this time in the late 60s, uh, the US was involved in Vietnam and uh, the Cold War. And so trying to spread democracy around the world and it's hard to spread dem democratic ideals around the world when a major swath of people within the U.S. don't have access to the basic rights uh, that democracy requires to function well. Um, and so this made the U.S. on the world stage look very hypocritical. Mm -hmm. um, and so signing the Civil Rights Act was a way to reckon for, uh, for political whites or like the elite political whites for them to reconcile that hypocritical problem on the world stage. Yeah, and I think that that's a fantastic point. You know, again, like people, marginalized groups in general really don't seem to gain any favor until there's something to be gained from the group in power. And I would say that while white people, you know, middle class and lower class white people tend to benefit from this systemic racism and the way the, the country is crafted, it really is like more, I always bring it to, it's really more of those upper class white people who are like your boss's boss who run the company, uh, run companies and countries and they run, um, you know, just these different governmental aspects. 
um, and societal aspects. Those are the people who have the most to gain. And those are, and I wouldn't necessarily display them as our enemies, but those are people who aren't exactly uh, looking out, uh, uh, looking out for our best interests. And we need to kind of restructure our frame of thought overall as looking at them as more of not a pro again, not necessarily the enemy, but like, as a problem in society and the way that they view society where um, marginalized groups, their, their, their grievances and the issues within those groups are looked at as tokens to, to garner some power in some other capacity, right? We need to rally around that. And so interest convergence then was the interests of the civil, civil rights activists trying to gain, you know, access to uh, democratic, the democratic process really to gain, to gain access to civil rights and then political um, elite whites wanting to appear like democracy was important. And so that's interest convergence. And then uh, intersectionality, which is um, what's coined by uh, Kimberly, Kimberly Crenshaw, who is a legal theorist. And this came out of her experience as a black woman moving in, um, within the black community working for racial justice and then within mostly white feminist circles working for uh, uh, to end sexism for, for gender equity. And so what she realized in her experience as a black woman is that working with white feminists, she could be a woman, but she couldn't be black because white, there's a racism problem with white feminists uh, ignoring the concerns of, of black women. And then within uh, black communities working for racial justice, she could be black, but she couldn't be a woman because of the sexism within those circles at the time. So, yeah, this is a fantastic, very interesting point. So my understanding of intersectionality, and I'm still very new and educating myself on all these things, but my understanding of intersectionality is the idea that basically everybody is made up of multiple identities and those identities can, uh, you know, conflict with each other to an extent. Right. So the example that he had used was a was a black woman. And when they were in the feminist space, they couldn't identify as black. And when they were in the black space, they couldn't identify as feminist, at least for um, like, you know, advocating for rights, rights advocation there. Because there were inherent issues in those individual communities that would suppress their other identities. Right. So, you know, black groups. Yeah, they're sexist. I would say that they're every I would say every every identity group, including white people, just to be clear has a ton of issues, right? At the way that they perceive and interpret the world. And a lot of times new identity, uh, the biggest issue is that with, with white groups, what's happening is generally the right thing, right? Uh, white groups, uh, they, them being bigoted in some capacity is looked at and like looked down upon, which is a good thing, right? Now I would say that we take it a little too far, but the, the way that we take it too far is that when it comes to other identity groups, we don't look down on the bigotry that they present. In fact, a lot of times, oftentimes it can be seen as body armor. And there was a TikToker who made a, a political, uh, you know, a particular political stance. And there was, it was a fair stance. It was like, Hey, if you're, if you're a, a black person and you're being, uh, you know, homophobic or transphobic you don't have the right to complain about people being racist towards you because you're propagating bigotry in the same way that other against lgbt people in the same way that other people white people or and really a lot of other people of color are um propagating racism towards you and he was shit on it for that right and it was publicly accepted that he was shit on um <clears throat> and that's like the thing right that's that's one of the problems that we're, that we're experiencing here, right? And now this gets into like this very very interesting conversation when it comes to intersectionality, which is like you know uh, the well I guess we can say you know how much homogeneity do we need versus how much um, heterogeneity do we need? And what I mean by that is in a particular uh, group, let's just say the black you know like, like um, you know BLM black rights activists in general, even if you don't want to go with BLM. How much similar viewpoints do we need versus how much, um, you know, differencing, differencing viewpoints do we need, right? And it's a very interesting conversation because in order, the, the, it's, this is very much like something taught in school. Groups that are fully homo, uh, with, groups that are fully in agreements with each other, they achieve nothing. Right. Group, these groups where it's like all one perspective and one minded, all you're doing is you're just reinforcing one idea that's not uh, 
contested in any capacity and it leads to zero growth you need a level of differences in opinion within your group in order for it to succeed right so when it comes to like a black movement that's like advocating for the rights of black people you need black women in that movement right you need gay people in that movement you need differencing perspectives um the problem is the balance between understanding those differences within your own community versus expressing them to what to, to what degree do we express them right because let's say you're in the black community and you're fighting for black rights if you advocate too much for women uh in that community or too much for lgbt people from that community you kind of lose sight of the overall narrative of pushing for black uh rights however if you don't acknowledge these other issues all you're doing is you're perpetuating racism uh excuse me sexism and and homophobia and transphobia within your own community which is a big problem because a normal like let's say a black man in relation to society has a grievance with white men or white people let's say black men have an issue with white people in society right however black women have an issue with not only white people in society but also black men in society because they are treated as less than generally speaking and then a black gay um woman in society has a grievance you, you understand where i'm getting to not only with the white man but also with the black man because they're gay um, and so like it's this very complicated intricate power dynamic where we need to contextualize how much uh difference we need versus how much we don't need uh to make sure that we push a clear message right and so i would say generally speaking when it comes to like a black group uh the you know, black group would say hey listen we have a grievance with the way that we're treated by other people mostly white people in society but black women are also valued and so are black gay people but that's not the focal point of their movement but it should be contextualized enough that's the point that i'm trying to make and i know that's a lot but like that's something that we very much need to do in society so there was no place where she was allowed to be her full self where she could be fully human and so intersectionality is the idea that we have these complex intersecting identities and that uh, a key aspect of this is the power dynamics involved with the way our identities intersect. And so while I as um, a white male might say, well, aren't uh, issues of gender, race, and um, sexual identity... Uh, Somebody's and, like, this lady's dead. She's alive. She's just chilling. ...and ability, all separate things... These are not actually separate things for someone who inhabits all of those identities. Um, and so the way those intersect is an important source of meaning making and is important to consider. And then uh, the other um, theme that we want to draw attention to is the centering of the voices and experiences of BIPOC folks. And so what's important about this, this can be a hard one for us as white people to practice um, because we're used to having our voices centered and our experiences centered um and so just for clarification bipoc means black um indigenous and then people of color as well and this this point gets a, a little bizarre for me can feel <laughs> uncomfortable when we start to decenter that and so i want to talk a little bit about this so the first aspect of this is that centering the experiences of bipoc folks um needs to not involve tokenizing I don't like the folks. I saw something on there like F O L X. So I don't know why it's like that. Isn't it F O X L? Maybe it's F O C K X. I don't know. Whatever. I'm just being silly. Or singling them out for their perspectives. So uh, whether or not an individual uh, person of color chooses to share their experience is their choice and must be respected. So I mean, an easy way to think about this is you know if you think about a time in your life where you went through some difficulty, um, you don't exactly want to be singled out in a group of strangers to share that time. Uh, that can be kind of rough. So it's that kind of idea um, that the agency and autonomy is um, of people is, is important to respect in this process. Oh, go back a little bit. Okay, so so just so you guys can read this, and I'll read it to you. I'm gonna. Um, it says centering the voices of BIPOC folks. This is not anti-white. Rather, it is recognition that white voices have dominated the discourse, and centering the voices of BIPOC folks disrupts this practice. Right. Now here's the thing. I'm gonna move this. Um, so you guys can continuously read it if you need to. This one gets a little tricky, right? And I'm going to explain to you why. Effectively, what this is saying, to my understanding, is that we need to decenter white perspectives when it comes to black issues, right? We need to make sure that black people are able to advocate for themselves more than white people, because then we get into the white savior kind of a thing. And I understand that. 
The problem is to the degree in which this is is uh, very socially toxic, or rather this message is warped from a very socially toxic perspective. And I'm going to explain to you why. Okay. Now, for those of you who don't know, I had an issue on TikTok where there was a particular audio that it just said, pick me, mass, so pick me, where a lot of black people have, a lot of progressive black people have been using it, in my opinion, as a way to dismiss the ideas and beliefs of other black people. And I noticed that, and I recognized that, and I said that. Now, the overwhelming response that I got was stay out of this, stay out of this, stay out of this. And the problem is, is that fundamentally they're following this like, oh, I should stay out of that issue. The problem is, is and this is an issue with all identity groups, not just black, not just LGBT, you know, also even white people where you're considered a traitor to your own race. If you have a thought process that deviates from that. Right. The difference is, is that white people are policed on that thought. Right. <clears throat> you know, it's not socially acceptable to diminish somebody, somebody's whiteness uh, for speaking out in a way that goes against the interests of white people. And I would say, right, because like white supremacy goes towards the interests of white people, but it's not OK ever. Right. Us moving forward and progressing as a society that values uh, marginalized groups overall reduces the power of non-marginalized groups which is fine with me i don't care right but that's that's you know that's encouraged the problem is is that's not really encouraged in other capacities right so i i spoke up on something right i saw something and i spoke on it i expected and i was called a white savior i expected no praise um i didn't care for the i didn't want any praise and also i was going against like the status quo right it's not like i was like oh my god you know black people are all victims i wasn't i'm not propagating a victim mentality in, a, in an identity groups like a lot of other people who i would consider white saviors are <clears throat> the thing is is that when i said that i was told i was instantly told like stay out of it this and the other thing the problem with telling people to stay out of your issues is that like regardless of whether we should centralize we should centralize black voices of course but you still need people who are in that power, like white people, to be on your side. And trying to silence them when it comes to an issue you disagree with them on is going to cause those individuals to say, well, I don't care about the issues we agree on, right? I'm somebody who talks about systemic racism. And on an individualized level, um, me as an individual, right? Remove Papa Gut, me as a person. I spoke up. I'm, I'm against systemic racism, right? I understand that it exists and I want to fight against it. When you have a socially acceptable movement that says, oh, you're... <clears throat> Don't talk about these issues every time somebody speaks on something um, rather than re-education. Because maybe I'm wrong. I don't think so. But maybe I'm wrong about the, the particular topic. Um, you're just hard. You're, you're, the reaction is going to be, okay, I don't care anymore. I'm just going to stop giving a shit about black people, right? You don't get to pick and choose when, when, when people are involved in your particular move, right? But then a lot of people are like, oh, you're nobody or this, or that. Take it to a higher level. I do have a representation on especially a lot of like younger conservative people. And so... If I decided, oh, screw black people now, and I don't, I haven't decided that, then like, you know, that's a voice that's very much trying, uh, and it's not even that I'm trying to go to, that I am trying to, to uh, you know, bring equality and equity to all marginalized groups, including black people, but purely on the foundation that everybody should have equal opportunity, right? I'm not like this old white savior guy, I get it, but like... You're, you could have turned me away. You could turn other people away. Like how many nuanced situations have happened where somebody was like on your side, understanding of your overall issues. And then maybe they just took a miss on one particular issue and the toxicity that you spewed caused them to turn more towards uh, some form of bigotry or racism. And that's what happens when you cancel people for simple mistakes, right? That's the whole thing. And this is kind of what we get here. And, and to bring up for context, you know, surprisingly there were a lot of black voices who spoke up and said i agree with this i agree that this you know because what the 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 the, the audio is making fun of was particular things um you know that were open for interpretation where some black people simply don't care and i will say that there is a level of toxicity in uh new age identity group all again even even white identity groups again i'm going to contextualize that like it's just not socially acceptable to be toxic as a white person <clears throat> um, where there's like this heavy level of gatekeeping and you're told that you are not this identity if you don't agree with this thing. So you're not black if you don't agree with the status quo. You're not gay if you don't agree with the status quo. You're not trans if you don't agree with the status quo. You're, you know, you're very much turned away from that. Right? That's the reality of that situation. Let's see. Agency um, and autonomy is 
what are you what exactly is the chat talking about are you talking about what i just said that nobody said that or are you guys talking amongst yourselves not entirely sure what you guys are talking about yes papa there's more to this that i'm taking a slight break to 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 try to listen to what people are saying in the chat um are you contesting what i had said before Yes, no? Or are you guys contesting each other? Okay, okay. Just making sure. Okay. Fair, 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 fair. Okay, so... <clears throat> uh, moving on from that. Now, there is like... the Like I made the stance in the beginning of this is that the theory is very sound. It can be the execution of the theory that ends up demonizing people, especially people who very much want to understand, or maybe they just don't. Um, but there is a toxic level, right? So let's use like white privilege, for, for example. White privilege is part of critical race theory, okay? Now, I've talked about how I don't like the packaging of white privilege because it very much demonizes white people just on face value for existing, um, I think that you could have had, you know, you could have called, I guess you could have called it BIPOC disprivilege, and that would have hit more um, because, you know, for me personally, it's very uncomfortable. It seems very demonizing. And a lot of times, you know, when you're, if you're told like, hey, I don't understand white privilege or it doesn't exist, you're, you're dragged rather than educated, right? Um, you know, that's kind of what it, and I think a lot of people, not even just on the name white privilege, and maybe I'm just piggybacking this because a lot of people use white privilege as a dismissal argument, right? In general, people use it as a dismissal. They'll be like, oh, you're privileged, so you just don't get it. So stop contributing to the conversation. You can't do that. Unfortunately, reducing marginalization is an uphill battle, and you need to educate people on it. And when you just constantly shame, and that's what happens. White people will either agree or disagree with something, and you're going to try to shame them into it rather than giving, sitting down and have a conversation. And that either causes people to fall victim to the shaming complex um, or it t turns people away and it, it, it generates, you know, manufactures more bigotry in those individuals. So now what I want to do is go through this because, the, you know, with the, with the thing that I had an issue with, um, and again, I should probably move my, my way so we can read this better. Um, this is Trump doubles down on ending racial sensitivity training, right? And this is kind of where we all go to. Because like we said, this, the theory of critical race theory is very sound and very solid. It's the application that may be poor. So we're going to go through this article and we're going to kind of try to uh, contextualize the issues and the grievances that not only Trump has, but other people have. And I'm going to tell you, some of it's simply uncomfortableness from white people, but some of it, I think there's a level of, of truth to it. Um, so yeah, President Donald Trump reinforces decision to eliminate racial sensitivity training in the federal workplace during the first presidential debate in September 29th, calling uh, central components of such training sick and insane. Now, the thing is, is the problem is, is that he, there's no context when you just call something sick and insane. There was nothing there. He could have like elaborated. He had two minutes. He could have elaborated. He could have said that I believe in racial, I believe in insensitivity training, but the, the, the ones that are proposed right now are very poor. Um, and then he, I believe he went on to talk about how we need to spread patriotism. I believe, I, I agree with spreading patriotism and teaching patriotism. Um, but the problem is, is that when you make the argument that racial insensitivity training is bad and we need to spread patriotism, it sounds like he's coming off as more of a, we need to spread nationalism. And I'm not trying to make it seem like Trump's racist or anything. I'm saying that he needs to learn to speak better and there's no more excuses. It's been three years and he should be able to um, display his thoughts in a solid and sound way. You know, there's enough of giving people too much of a benefit of the doubt, right? Um, <clears throat> I ended it because it's, it's racist. I ended it because a lot of people were com uh, complaining that they were asked to do things that were absolutely insane, that it was a radical revolution that was taking place in our military, in our schools, and everywhere else. Again, what exactly is it that he was specifically talking about? Because in his thing, he didn't say anything. Um, much of federal government's racial sensitivity training is conducted by outside contractors, and Trump took issue with the spending across agencies on the topic. Uh, we were paying hundred, uh, people hundreds of thousands of dollars to reach very bad ideas and were frankly very sick ideas. They were teaching people to hate our country, and I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to allow that to happen. Now, here's this thing. What's that interpretation mean? Because like we said, in the theory, the idea that America was founded on racism is true. It's uncomfortable, but it's true. 
However, to what degree did we take that theory and push it? Did we take it to a point where, where everybody's inherently garbage? Or did we just use it as a point of context so that we make sure that we look at things in a less biased way as we move forward? That's kind of the question. Um, the administration has instructed federal agency leadership to begin identifying contracts for training that contains concepts like white privilege and inherent bias so that they can begin ending such contracts. How quickly that process will take will likely depend on the, uh, the details of each contract and how much work and payment each contract is entitled to before it can be terminated. So it seems like, if I'm reading this correctly, um, Trump's administration is looking to still talk about white privilege and inherent bias. So, you know, if he had said this in the debate, I think it would have been fantastic. I think it would have been fantastic. If Trump had said, listen, uh, the, 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 the current racial insensitivity training is far too progressive in the sense of demonizing white people, but we're still trying to teach uh, the racial insensitivity training in a better way that's more uniting and maybe has more of a focus on patriotism. I would have, I would have, I would have been voting Trump. All right. I would have been voting Trump. Um, and I know a lot of people are saying America was not founded on racism. America was founded on all men are equal. equal. I, I agree with that. I appreciate that. And I kind of agree with it to an extent, but you have to understand that America was founded on slavery as well. And as uncomfortable as it is, we need to understand that like racism absolutely was a foundation to an extent in American society. There was a, an issue with white supremacy uh, and there is a little bit now, but like we're, we're going down. But we need to understand that like def like America's ideals were founded in like the ideal that everyone was equal. It was a fantastic word, word that they used that would absolutely continue to help a uh, propagated society that's much more humane and just nowadays, even if we're not as where I feel we should be. But we did have slavery. Those men were not treated equal and they are a foundation of, they were a foundation of our society. Okay. We need to understand that. All right. Just throwing it out there, guys. Okay. Uh, and it's not just, I, I brought it up before, other white groups were, were subject to racism because it's very socially acceptable to be racist, at least back then. Right. We need to understand that, guys. Okay. Um, so yeah, former uh, Vice President Joe Biden called such training both inside and outside the federal government important to, for bringing people together rather than dividing them. Now, again, it seems like Trump kind of agrees. He just won't say it because he's pandering to his base, I think, uh, honestly. Um, but again, if the argument is that it's too radical, radical to an extent, I could, I, maybe I could agree with that. I'm not too educated specifically on the training, but it seems like if they're, uh, they're, they're they want to oust it in, in favor of something that's better, that still contextualizes which this still seems to contextualize critical race theory, <clears throat> then I don't see an issue with that. There is racial insensitivity. People have been made aware of what other people feel like, what insults them, what does it mean to them. It's important that people know uh, many people don't want to hurt other people's feelings, but it makes a big difference. It's a gigantic difference in the way uh, a child is able to grow up and have self-esteem. That's, that's a fair argument, but you know, again, um, you know, this can be applied to Trump's new insensitivity training as well. Uh. Um. The only way we're going to bring this country together is to bring it together. Okay, that's true. Right? That's the end of that article. Um, you know, and you know, it, it's just it's unfortunate the wordage that Trump had used to to talk about this. And so I want to end this segment off with this. I want to. This is a this is a, a bit of a you know a video where this guy's kind of talking against racial insensitivity, uh, rather, uh, you know, critical, uh, you know, race theory. And whatnot, and how it can be portrayed as toxic, and I think that maybe I can agree, but I think that getting like kind of the more far right perspective on it um, might be like something that's very good for us to do. So tonight we found, and also it's loud as fuck. That's not good. Ask Chris Rufa to walk us through some of what is happening here. You should know the details. Rufa was a research fellow at the Discovery Institute as well as a contributing editor at City Journal, and he joins us now. Chris Rufo, thanks so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks, you know, folks. Tucker, this is something I've been investigating for the last six months, and it's absolutely astonishing how critical race theory has pervaded every institution in the federal government. And no, right off the bat, I don't think it's necessarily wrong that critical race theory has gone into the government. What I've dis but let's discovered see. is that critical race theory has become, in essence, the default ideology of the federal bureaucracy and is now being weaponized against the American people.
But I guess that's the point that we kind of come to is the weaponization of it. I'd like to share three investigations that I've unleashed uh, that show the kind of depth of this critical race theory, a cult indoctrination uh, and the danger and destruction it can wreak. Uh, first, the Treasury Department. Uh, I broke the story on the. Right. So this is the, uh, uh, you know, some wordage being used here. <clears throat> So watch Robin D'Angelo on YouTube, the author of White Fragility. She talks about how white people struggle to own their own racism, right? And again, we talked about how there's like inherent racism in society. But this gets tricky because when you, when you label somebody a racist rather than saying, hey, I think that you just have a misinterpretation of the way things are. You may have an inherent bias or an implicit bias. Um, you, you, you definitely, uh, you're, you're kind of balancing on the line of completely losing or demonizing a particular individual. These are sensitive issues and people don't want to be racist. You understand white people most don't want to be racist. They just don't understand how they may be being racist or rather racially ignorant to an extent. So when you approach them, be like, yeah, you don't understand. Like you're just racist. It's like, oh, well, fuck you. That's what that would be most people's response. And like, I could tend to agree, right? Um, here's another, while she discusses the roots of white supremacy, of which she asserts virtually all white people, regardless of how woke they are, contribute to racism. Now, I want to be accurate. This may be true to an extent, right? Um, what I had made the argument before is that it's the elites. It's like the, it's the financial elites, but like the white elites, um, who are the ones who really heavily contribute to this racism, right? They constantly are pitting us against each other from a racial perspective. It's really very true. Um, not not because I you know I don't know if it's because they're inherently racist. It's because it's very distracting. You know, as a white individual, um, those white a middle class white man, you might be like, oh man, I just lost my job, um, because uh, somebody from across the southern border came and took it. Rather than being like, oh, I'm a white man, I lost my job because um, Amazon or rather factories decided that they were going to uh, displace my job with robotics, right? It's easier to shift the blame onto people, other people that are, have inherent differences than it is to actually critically think and be like, oh, it's not other people per se, or it's not other people of color per se. It's like the, it's, it's the system in place that's, uh, that is starting to oppress me. And now I'm going to turn that anger onto people of color. And then in turn, while they're fighting for, uh, you know, they're fighting for equality, we get into this fight where people start bashing each other to to some extent. So it gets very gets very messy, very complex, very let's say nuanced to an extent. Um so yeah, and I will say that white people uh everybody everybody has tri is tribalistic inherently. We all tend to stick to our own. If we had a society that was all Hispanic, it would be the exact same thing as our society that's all white. Like if all western countries were all black, they would be doing the same shit to us, right? Nobody's inherently more or less tribalist than each other. We're all very tribalist, okay? So let's just kind of try to keep that in mind right now. The Treasury Department, which held uh, a, a seminar uh, earlier this year uh, from a man named Howard Ross, a, a diversity trainer who has billed the federal government more than $5 million over the past 15 years, uh, conducting seminars on critical race theory. Uh, and he told... Well, I mean, if he's representing a, a group, I mean, who knows, you know? The government tends to spend money poorly in general, so I, you know, I don't know. Treasury employees essentially that America was a fundamentally a white supremacist country, and I quote... So, like, I would say... Virtually all white people uphold the... Right, so I would say that to an extent America was inherent. So when you say inherently, you know, that, that sounds like paraphrasing. Um, because the paraphrasing, I would assume, comes from the idea that America was founded on racism. Uh, I would say all countries are founded on racism. Let's be honest here. Right. Until like new age, I would say like Western cultures, uh, which I think are very actively trying to fight against um, like ideas of white supremacy or rather a particular racial supremacy and colonization, um, you know, and racism. Every single country was founded on racism to an extent and slavery right they were found or colonizing excuse me colonization and slavery right because like race issues race is more of i think a new age newer age like six, like the 1600s is when race came into play most people didn't give a shit about skin color apparently until before them but every country was founded on slavery of some people and then colonizing other places right it was a very barbaric world of pure colony like, takeover. We take over stuff. We have more power. We use people and we demean them to so give free cheap labor, right? Very cheap labor. Everybody did it. 
right? And then we developed this idea of race, and I believe it was in France. And like, you know, all of a sudden, ideas of supremacy of a particular race started to develop where that may not have been the case before. And so America started, and there was, again, there was racial, uh, there was like racial supremacy in the United States, and that was a foundation of the country, even if it's not foundation of the ideals in that country, okay? That's the point I'm trying to make. I, we're, we're looking at things from two different places. A conservative will say that's not true. It's not founded on racism. And I would say that's because you're looking at it from a very idealized perspective. And I don't disagree with your, your, your assertion there, right? But like practically versus ideally, right? We did, we were founded on racism. And I would say that your, the, the ideal, the idyllic nature of the foundation of all of it, people are created equally is the theory that the United States was founded on much like critical race theory is a theory. And in theory, those things are fantastic, right? All men are equal or all people are equal is, is a fantastic theory. Just like uh, critical race theory is a fantastic theory. It's the application of both of these things where we are having a problem. So if you look at it like that, I think you'll be have a more of an understanding of like what I'm trying to say when I'm saying that we were founded on racism, right? From a practical perspective, just like I think that critical race theory may be taking it too far and demonizing white people, right? That's my point, right? System of racism and white superiority and was essentially denouncing the country and asking white employees at the Treasury Department and affiliated organizations uh, to accept their white privilege. You know, some of this really just seems like fragility from from like I don't, I don't I, from these white people. Right. Uh, you know, it just seems like fragility more than anything else. It's an uncomfortable truth. And there are older individuals who just don't want to sit back and say, okay, like how much of this is true, right? So like for like me, for instance, I've said I don't like the framing of white privilege. And I do think that to an extent when you constantly victimize, uh, you know, people of color, you're, you're, you're contributing to a victim mentality that will never help them better themselves. But when I look at it, I say, okay, there's still a truth there. There's still like a truth of like, you know, some form of, you know, people of color having it worse. Right. That makes sense to you guys. We're allowed to contextualize things. And I like to come from the, 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 the framework of there's three different there's three aspects of the general aspects to me of political correctness. There's non-political correctness. There's political correctness and there's overly political correctness. We should be trying to maintain political correctness. But like, you know, we don't want to shift towards the other sides um, because that's when we hit a point of pandering to particular groups. And so when conservatives talk about part of the solution, uh, and I say that they focus too heavily on it, but being working hard and whatnot and, and you know, um, uh, like bettering yourself, it exists. It just lacks the context of, um, you know, opportunity not being expanded properly. Just like progressive people will focus too heavily on the lack of opportunity and not at all on the mentality through it. When these two things in some capacity both need to be contextualized and used as a solution to move forward. Uh, accept uh, their white uh, racial superiority uh, and accept uh, central and i would i want to i want to say i don't know if it's in this video well we'll see if it's on the video uh, all of the uh, baggage that comes uh, with this reducible essence of whiteness uh, second uh, this is not by any means limited to the treasury department critical race theory has actually uh, now infiltrated uh, our criminal justice system the uh, just this week i released a story that the fbi is now holding weekly seminars on intersectionality uh, which is a hard left academic theory. I don't like, listen, like this is like very demonizing language to me. It's not like, hey, intersectionality is very complex and bizarre, right? We had a conversation about before. Uh, it can be difficult to grasp your mind, but I think it's like overall a good thing to be learning about, right? I think so. Uh, that reduces people to a network of racial, gender, and sexual orientation identities uh, that intersect in complex ways and determine whether you are an oppressor or oppressed. Uh, obviously, with the white straight male, such as FBI Director Christopher Wray, uh, being at the top of this pyramid of evil. And third, this is a major story. Uh, critical race theory is now uh, infiltrating into our scientific establishment. Uh, a few weeks ago, I released a story uh, that critical race theorists uh, at the Sandia National Laboratories, uh, which creates our nuclear weapons arsenal, uh, sent their white male executives on a three-day re-education camp. 
uh, to deconstruct their white male culture uh, and actually force them to write letters of apology uh, to women and people of color. That last part's bizarre. Like the force to write letters and apologize in that weird way, um, you know, which I think is one of those things we're talking about where you can take uh, cl critical race theory too far. Uh, whistleblowers within Sandia National Laboratories have now spoken out, uh, but laboratory executives have dispatched counterintelligence teams uh, to quickly erase their communications, uh, silence, and shut them down. And this is really the bottom line. Uh, there are some great people in D.C., such as Senator Josh Hawley in Missouri, that are starting to push back. But conservatives need to wake up that this is an existential threat to the United States. And the bureaucracy, even under the Trump administration, is now being weaponized against core traditional American values. And I So to that point of the core traditional American values, right, I, I remember reading something I, I, don't, I can't find. It's something, the, a point... Um, that Trump, or I think Trump brought up, or there's a Trump, oh, maybe I could try to find it. There was an article or something that Trump had written uh, that was specifically, um, uh, like, as to why they don't like uh, critical race theory. Um, maybe I can find it. It was, like, the official White House uh, document. Uh, ba 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 Let me see. Uh, uh, I don't know if I can actually find it. All right, so I can't specifically find it, but um, it was a point that Trump had brought up, and it was the idea that hard work, one of the contestants he had with teaching critical race theory, or rather insensitivity training that was based on critical race theory, was that um, the wordage said that um, it is a inherent white value to some extent. It said of um, nuclear family, uh, and hard work um, and, and things of that likeness were uh, uh, was was like an inherently white framed thing or and like judo Christian values I believe is the way they or you get my point um, those were like white inherent talking points right but, you know and it was a bizarre thing to say and what it sounded like more to me was that less than being dismissed for those values it was more of dismissing the constant conservative argument that just because like you're poor because you're not religious you're not contributing to the nuclear family um do you understand my point i think that that was the contestment and i can't find the article of course you know that's it's, but that's kind of what they're talking about and like oftentimes yeah it's always like oh you're poor well just go get married by this age and uh, go be Christian and uh, or go be religious and go contribute. You have a nuclear family and you'll be fine. And oftentimes that's not as easy or practical. And I would argue that um, first and foremost, the reason that that people aren't unsuccessful because they're not embracing those ideals per se. I think that people are not embracing those ideals because uh, those are ideals that are synonymous with American culture and they don't feel America has worked for them. So they do not care. Right. I'm a, I'm a polyamorous agnostic individual. I, and I don't even I honestly wouldn't even say I work hard. Right. Just so you guys know, we constantly throw the word hard work out there for like a talking point. A lot of conservatives do most middle, a lot of middle class blue collar jobs, specifically union middle class jobs. I was I was in there. I got paid decently. I'm not a hard worker. You don't work very hard. I'm just being honest with you. OK, being in a union is about like doing the least amount of work possible. Right. So we throw around hard work as if it's like this big thing. But honestly, you know, a lot of times, a lot of a lot of middle class, you know, Americans, not even just white people, it's everybody. They do the best you can in a union. Like the union's job is to make you do as little as possible. Right. Versus the company to make you do as much as possible. So the dichotomy there is like so very hyperbolic. Right. And so we need to acknowledge that. Right. So like this hard work, like we should work hard for sure. But like. How hard are we? Are people saying to work hard really working? There are people that work tremendously hard, 
but like I'll tell you that people who worked underneath me worked harder than I did. <laughs> right? So let's just keep that in, in mind. Let's just keep that in mind. I'd like to make it explicit. Uh, the president of the White House, it's within their authority and power to immediately issue an executive order abolishing critical race theory trainings from the federal government. And I call on the president uh, to immediately issue this executive order and, and stamp out this destructive, divisive, pseudoscientific ideology at its root. Uh, and I think that it's... <laughs> He's really hates it, man. It's not a bad theory. Maybe you just believe that the practice is poor something that he's denounced, uh, this kind of Black Lives Matter and neo-Marxist rhetoric in places like Portland and Seattle. Uh, but it's time to take action and destroy it within his own administration. The consequences of what you described are, are profound. I think we're seeing some of them now on you, our streets. Do you think that? But I want to get you, to the second example it. because it, it may be the most troubling of all, the Department of Justice. So the underlying <laughs> idea behind our entire justice system is that all of us are treated equally under the laws of the United States. Your race, your gender, who you sleep with are irrelevant in the eyes of the law. In theory, right? They are <clears throat> in the eyes of the law. In theory, right? Let's keep that in mind. Just like critical race theory is a theory, a sound theory, so are the ideas that everybody are to be treated equally. The execution of these theories, though, are done by people who may have particular biases towards particular things. And I would say that the CRT, the critical race theory, uh, progressives take that and they push it in this biased way, maybe intentional or not, towards like being to an extent diminishing of white people in the same way where the theory of, these, of, of American freedom and foundation that everybody's equal are pushed from more conservative people who diminish people of color, right? How could the FBI, which is armed and empowered to uphold those laws, be disseminating lies like this, which are exactly... Somebody made the point that the critical theory is a part of the neo-Marxism. It tells us that racism cannot be solved. Okay, I could just simply disagree with that aspect of it, that uh, it can't be solved under a liberal democracy, because I think it, it can. I think that the pro well, a lot of people, we have, to, uh, we have to keep this in mind, a lot of people don't understand this, and it's something that's rather frustrating, okay? I want to get you guys to wrap your minds around this idea, that the labelings of particular things are fucking irrelevant, right? Us going to communism from capitalism isn't going to make society better. It's this new age idea of throwing something away because it's not perfect. Just because critical race theory may not be perfect in that sense doesn't mean it can't be changed and bettered in a better way, right? Execution is human execution that's the problem particular idea like capitalism isn't a problem it's human execution we need to contextualize the greed of human beings the greed the selfishness the laziness of human beings and that's why we have like governments to like moderate these particular things right so like from a social perspective capitalism would be fine if People in power didn't lack empathy from not having empathy for people by growing up the way that we did, not giving a shit about us. Okay, we got to keep that in mind. So we have to. We need better social change. That's really what it comes down to. And of course, laws are going to have to be implemented to propagate that social change. But also, like you know, if you want social change, if you want to get people on the same page, if you want everybody to truly believe in the idea of equal opportunity, you need to provide equal opportunity to all people. And we need to fight against particular people in power who don't care about equal opportunity, okay? Because when you contribute these talking points, you're like, equal, you know, work harder. They deserve the... We're not having a conversation here where we could actually, like, push for good. We're just giving people, like, rich people, people in power, too much of the benefit of the doubt. Exactly contrary to their mission. I mean, how corrosive is that? How scary is that? It's extremely corrosive. And what we're seeing is that the institutions of the federal government, the actual bureaucracies and agencies and this kind of permanent administrative state has really abandoned the core American principles of equality under the law, of judging individuals as individuals on their merits. And they're now adapting this radical left ideology of judging people from their group identity. I, I guys, I just want to be honest with you. I haven't seen Tucker Carlson like alive. I've seen some good shit with him versus Charlie Kirk, but... This is a, this is ridiculous. <laughs> just the just the framework. It's so hyperbolic. Even if maybe what they're saying has truth to it, it's so hyperbolic. It's so le it's so anti left and anti progressive 
that it's like not even like some I would I understand why people are like I'm not even going to consume this. It's just contributing to the divide. Uh, and it's absolutely terrifying that the FBI, which has uh, all, almost kind of plenary uh, physical authority in the United States, uh, would be adapting this ideology. And I think it's a red alert moment. And all Americans should be deeply uh, worried about their country. They, they should be. I am deeply worried about our country, but not necessarily because of critical race theory, uh, just because we have massive uh, in income equality and racial uh, equality and divide in the United States. That's literally tearing us apart. And everybody on each side doesn't give a shit about the perspective of other people. And now we're here where we can't even come to a common understanding or a common solution that would truly help rather than some bullshit feel good tactic that doesn't help and just contributes to that divide. This has nothing to do with this election. It has to do with our future as a nation. Very quickly, there are reports that this is going on in the United States military. Is that true? Uh, yeah, I've had some uh, leaks from inside the U.S. military, uh, in the Air Force and the Navy. Uh, I'm still working on these stories to source them, to confirm them. Uh, but what I can say is this, is that they are essentially starting in 2011 with an Obama executive order uh, mandating diversity and inclusion initiatives throughout the federal government. Uh, they've created these offices of diversity and inclusion. So, like, I want to talk about that point because this is kind of like touches on like even... Um, People are like, oh, you know, Papa, I think that, what is it called? Why can't I think? Uh, like affirmative action is like bad because like it's racist towards white people, right? And the argument is, is that basically affirmative action programs, um, those are those are forms of systemic oppression against white people, right? And maybe you can make that argument because they do look at white people and say, oh, bad boy, but uh, right in favor of a person of color, but, you know, I would say that these diversity measures are a band-aid effect on a bigger issue because they're, they, they stem from the, uh, you know, the systemic racism that people receive as people of color, right? So like, yeah, is it systemic racism towards white people? Maybe, but why does it exist, right? And while it doesn't do what I think it needs to do, it's a step forward in the right direction. What we need to be focusing on more, guys, isn't, it's not here. Because here, this is, this is what, this is what, um, affirmative action programs like this do like we deal with it up here at the top level what it does is it's like hey if a black person has the same qualifications or maybe a little bit less but generally the same qualifications as a white person we need to take the black person over the white person right right so you go oh that's racist now i will make the argument that a black person having a decent job will allow them to develop uh, you know generational wealth pass it on to their family and you know like create a family with more wealth and more opportunity but focusing up here is less what I want to do. Top of the chain, who fucking cares? It's the bottom. It's the path to getting here. And it is, generally speaking, easier for a white person to get to this point than it is for a black person to get to this point. Due to uh, poverty, which has a tremendous impact on self-esteem, on uh, education, on ability to get extra help, on the ability to do particular job opportunities in areas, right on your happiness level because you don't have money to buy things that make you happy and like that's what we need to focus on okay is providing opportunities to these individual people who ostensibly are supporting uh, greater diversity, but in practice, according to sources throughout the federal government, uh, serve as almost internal intelligence services uh, to perpetuate this ideology and to root out conservative ideas and ultimately purge conservative employees. A diverse country can't can't handle this for long. We uh, need to be unified by our equality under the law, or we won't be yeah. unified. And by the way, if there are people watching this who've experienced Tucker it, is. I hope you'll reach out to us whistleblowers within the military or other federal agencies. We'll reach out to Chris Rufo or to us because we're going to keep on this story. Chris Rufo, thanks so much for your report tonight. Oh, you it. want them to be whistleblowers? Well, you know, it's it's all. It's all about uh, sticking to your own kind in the military until it's something that you disagree with, huh, Tucker? Poopy peepee. So yeah, 